Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We want to thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity in a three-part series uh, with the Castro Mitchell family. Super excited to have uh, kind of our finale of this episode with uh, Richard and Josh on the in the hot seat uh, on the Latter Day Stories couch. So, if you missed our previous versions, uh, two episodes back, our uh, in this three part series was uh, Richard's interview where we discussed uh, a lot of his life. He was a former bishop who ends up coming out a little later in life. Um, shares his experience not only serving in church uh, leadership but also um, within uh, the United States Army and his career there. And kind of how his story unfolds with hiding and not sharing a lot about who and what he was uh, and kind of building a life outside of who um, Richard really is. And it was just a beautiful story of, of kind of uh, what authenticity and honesty looks like, uh, what also uh, life looks like making really hard and difficult decisions specific to entering into a mixed orientation relationship and then um, divorcing uh, his four children, uh, his responsibilities and opportunities uh, within Mormonism and leadership callings. But we also talked about conversion therapy and aversion therapy as well. So just a fascinating story about uh, Richard's experience. And then uh, following up, we had uh, Josh, his husband's uh, story as well. Josh uh, discussed a great episode about um, his intergenerational uh, relationship, his marriage with his husband, but also uh, being raised Roman Catholic in the Philippines, and then uh, moving eventually after his his mother uh, married a, an American, moving to Utah of all places, um, and his experience uh, with Mormonism, converting to the church, and uh, growing up a, a gay uh, Filipino in Tree Mountain, Utah, in northern Utah, in a very rural uh, community, in a near the Utah Idaho border. So a fascinating story, but also a, just a touching and beautiful message as well to the Filipino, um, a, a message of, of, of the Filipino culture and customs and that experience that, that has uh, melded and helped Josh become the beautiful person that he is. So with that little preface aside, um, I want to welcome uh, to the studio again, um, the couple of the hour, because this will be exciting. We left both of your episodes with the kind of the teaser uh, and tangent that uh, really kind of, we ended your stories with dating. And Richard, you, the part of your episode that ended was the discussion of, of dating. And the very last person uh, that you dated was also the first person and it's also the same person that's sitting on the couch with you. So um, I think that part of the story is going to be super fascinating. Um, Josh, we talked a little bit about your uh, experiences being um, having a desire to date older men and kind of you navigating that world. So I want to um, I want to bring the audience into this story with uh, the how did you two meet? Um, what was it that brought you two together? And I'm interested in, in learning how this relationship started. Well, he was my bishop. <laughs> <laughs> That's That's actually the joke that he tells everybody when they ask how we met. Even I was honestly like, what <laughs> on earth? This thing just took a complete turn. Bishop? Yeah, that is actually the joke that he loves to tell everybody when they ask <laughs> how we met. I was never his bishop, uh, <laughs> but it is a fun way to tell people how I, we met. Yeah, I was just like to tell that joke. But... Okay, even I was a little worried and thinking, <laughs> what did I miss in the last episode? That uh, <laughs> This great revelation. <laughs> No. So he wasn't your bishop? No, he wasn't my bishop. But uh, we met online um, on a dating app. And, you know, I just kind of saw Richard. And back then, um, he was still just fresh out of his separation. So he was being a little bit more discreet. Um, so he was using a very different name. 
um, also just using a picture of um, his biceps even. Um, so I don't know why I was attracted to that, um, but I was. So I messaged, my, messaged him and I just told him, you know, if we could hang out. And um, I invited him over to my place and we hang out for three hours just talking and just um, getting to know each other. And soon after that, um, you know, we just liked the company. And I think when you were driving home, you sent me a text message saying, I really want to get to know you more. And, you know, at that point, I really know that this was something different. Um, I really felt something different with him. Um, I, I would love to like kind of explore that because you say that with a smile and it, it makes me a little bit giddy. What, what about Richard was different? Um, you had had, you had dated a little bit prior, um, to, to meeting Richard. So what was different about this relationship? He just has a very warm, um, and he has a nice way with his words. Um, he's just very much caring and, you know, and maybe it was his Justin Bieber hairstyle back then. <laughs> he had like a very long hairstyle. Um, but, um, you know, like he just a great smile on his face and just very positive. I really like that. It was a little different for me in the sense that First of all, I was not really wanting to do the whole dating app thing. I wasn't even sure I wanted to figure out how to date. I was more comfortable with just hanging out with people I knew, friends. Um, but by experiment, I did um, try the dating app. And um, what I found interesting about Josh's approach was that Instead of, like he said, he invited me over to his house. Well, actually what he did was he dropped a pin, which I didn't even know what that was or how to navigate based on a pin, but I decided what the heck, I'm going to give this thing a shot. And, uh, and, um, you know, that was like one of my concerns too, is like with older people, like just for my security, um, I just didn't want to drop my address or something like that. So. I just gave you a pin and let you figure it out. And it was hard to figure out. But when I finally thought I was in the right area, um, I had been messaging him. Hey, hey, you know, I think I'm in the right area. Can you give me the exact address? Nothing. No response. Nothing. And so my first experience with a dating app, I was ready to trash it and never try this again because I thought this was ridiculous. But... I noticed on my map that the end of the street was a dead end. So I determined I was going to go to the dead end, turn around and drive out. And as I got to the dead end and turned around, starting towards getting out of this neighborhood, I get a, a message back from him telling me what the address was. And what really impressed me was when I pulled up to park, he came out of the house and I thought this was cool. I wasn't going to have to like blindly knock on a door. I was actually getting to meet the person out on the front yard. So that was the first time we met. Even though he's out there trying to play hard to get. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he later tells me that he was like showering and stuff because he was getting ready for, you know, the fact that we were going to hang out for a little bit. And um, anyway, it was fun. Um, I did learn a lot about him um, in the three hours. Uh, I was fascinated with him. And I honestly, I didn't think of anything serious coming from it. I just thought this was a great opportunity to make another friend. But as Josh said, when I pulled out, I just kept having this feeling like I needed to reach back out to him and really solidify that we were going to hang out more. So I basically said, is there any chance that we could go have lunch together or something like that? And he agreed. The, uh, the first part of this discussion, as I'm, I'm listening and knowing um, a little bit about the, the story prior to this and the story after this, I'm curious, um, knowing Josh was so much younger um, than you, Richard, 
how does that play into um, saying, hey, we, we should probably hang out and meet again? Um, kind of walk us through what that experience was like. So I would definitely say most people who know me know that I am young at heart. So like Josh says, he appreciates maturity. Um, I really appreciate um, the the whole idea of living that young life. And I'm not Peter Pan. I want to grow up. But at the same time, uh, I find so much value in the younger generation and um, helping me to stay young and continue to do things that I love to do. And so, again, I, I thought, well, this is somebody that would be fun to hang out with in the future. I was thinking more of a friendship. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, that that hope of friendship turned into dating, which was actually a super fun part of our getting to know each other. Um, we would take turns coming up with date ideas. We rarely told each other what the date idea would be or what the date plan was until it was time to execute the plan. And we actually kept a blog about all of this, um, just in personal writings uh, about our experiences and such. Um, but with every date, it became evident that I was actually falling in love with this person. Um, do you recall a date at a laser tag facility in like Sandy or Cottonwood Heights? That was the, you set that date up. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And I only bring this up, um, and I'll talk about this a little later in the episode, but that's where I actually met you two. And that's where I remember seeing you and just from the periphery, just from the outside looking in. Um, you two were on a date and I remember watching, uh, I remember watching you. I remember watching the way you interacted together and it was immediately, um, evident that you two were dating, uh, getting to know each other. And to me, it was just, uh, it was kind of heartwarming. It was exciting to be able to, to see that and to see kind of that relationship blossom. And Josh, I 100% remember the Justin Bieber hair. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I. Huh? It should make a comeback. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's good. I think it's good to leave that back in the past. So you have done some really great things for Richard, yeah. um, especially in the hair department. Yeah. Uh, how soon does this relationship begin become serious? Uh, and uh, I mean, clearly you got to know each other in the beginning, but let's talk about feelings and the this relationship starting to grow because as you talked about earlier uh in your episode richard um josh is the first person that you have dated and there has to be some part of that that maybe in your mind says am i am i putting all my eggs in this basket prematurely yeah um certainly that was a concern um and and almost to the reaching back to my um my first marriage in that it was kind of a blind marriage, so to speak. I mean, I knew her before we got married, but certainly um, I, I had chosen her in part because of the fact that, uh, well, just she was Asian and, and from a faraway area. So that did come into play with me and my thoughts. But what was much more overwhelming than that was this idea that I was way too old for Josh. And I can recall um, us going out on a date. We had gone to dinner and the plan was to go to a movie afterwards. But between dinner and the movie, we were in the car and I said to him that as much as I loved him and uh, appreciated our time together, that I felt like he should be dating somebody his own age. And that I didn't want my my age to bring down the potential and the possibilities for this wonderful person who had a whole life ahead of him. Do you remember what you said mm -hmm. back to me? Yeah. Go ahead. No, go. <laughs> I just told him that, um, you know, if it's not you, 
you know, you don't, you, you don't control who I'm, attra- I'm attracted to. Um, so if it's not you, it's just going to be another, you know, just older, mature person. Um, and I think that kind of helped solidify, um, his feelings for me that, um, you know, that we can definitely grow into this relationship, but we, we definitely, f- um, fell hard, very, fell very hard, very early on in our relationship, our, our relationship, I'd say like three weeks into, um, you know, we said that we love each other and that's when we, um, officially became, um, boyfriends. Um, and it slowly just developed after that. I, um, as I'm just kind of methodically listening to the story and and thinking of how this unfolds, you each have families and you each, um, Richard, in your case, you had divorced, you have four older children. Um, I really want to better understand how your families reacted to the news. And at what point did you tell them that you're dating Josh and then bring age and that discussion into the conversation? So for me, um, because of my relationship with my children, it was very easy for me to tell them about the fact that Josh was young. In fact, Josh is the same age as my youngest daughter. And um, we went bowling together. We went and had dinner together. We did a number of things that included um, specifically my girls. Um because I just felt comfortable that they knew their dad and they loved their dad and they trusted their dad. Um, that if Josh was the person that I loved, then they would not just approve of the relationship, but that they would love Josh as well. Um, I was much more worried about the other side, like meeting his family and worrying about what they were thinking um, than I was about my own, my own children. What about your experience, Josh? Um, Cause I think, I think Richard paints that in a great way. Like um, he, I mean, he has his own, um, his own dynamics within his family to kind of explain and understand um, their unique needs. But what about your family? How would, you, your family hadn't, um, you hadn't had an extensive dating history either. So how, how do you approach that subject with your family and how did they react? Yeah, so the, the only other guy that I've introduced to my mom was the guy in his mid-30s. Um, but, you know, that quickly fell apart. Um, and Richard was the second guy that I introduced. And, um, you know, that's kind of how my discussion with my mom went on on why I'm feeling this way for, you know, um, older, um, generation. Um, but I think my mom was just very supportive and very much open to, um, my feelings and, um, even my sisters, um, they were very much, um, accepting. Um, I can understand that they may have some concerns, um, you know, if Richard's using me, if I'm rich, using Richard, um, but that quickly dissolved once they got to know us. What I would like to say about really even the entire family dynamic is I, I give all sides huge amounts of credit because I can remember meeting your mom for the first time. And it was very obvious that what she cared about most was not who I was, but whether I was going to be there for Josh, whether I was going to help Josh grow, whether I was going to, she, her, her worries were for Josh. And I could just tell she was open to anybody if they were somebody that Josh loved and that's it. They were somebody that, um, would, take care of Josh. Um, but I mean, if we were to fast forward to today, our relationship with 
each other's families, I think probably is better than most um, in-law relationships are in the sense that we get along very well. Um, we laugh, we cry, we, I, I feel like there's nothing I couldn't tell your family and there's nothing that your family has shied away telling me. And it's a great experience. And I often kid that sometimes I feel like my daughters love Josh more than they love dad. <laughs> So I don't know, uh, it's, it may not work for everybody, but it maybe helps solidify in my mind that this was all a good thing because we, it's just worked and it's worked well. Our families are super supportive and, um, you know, when we get to the point of talking about the wedding, um, what amazed me is just how two families came together and really help put a, a day together that can never be forgotten. I, I love uh, Josh's response to you uh, in, concern, uh, in relation to this discussion about age, um, where he specifically says, Richard, if it's not going to be you, it will be someone in that very same situation, which I think was just really eloquent the way he kind of laid that out. Like, I, I'm not looking at this as... Um, an issue with you. I'm saying you are who I'm attracted to. How, um, how did that strike you? Yeah. I, as soon as he said it, I, I was overjoyed because yeah, what he was saying to me was, dude, if you don't love me, then I'll go find somebody else, but you don't get to choose for me who I date and who I don't date. So if anybody thinks this is a daddy son situation, no, Josh doesn't want a dad. He doesn't want a father and he doesn't need those from me. He is his own man, but yeah, it was very refreshing for him just to say to me, look, I love you, but you don't get to choose who I date and who I don't date other than you can step away or you can be part of this. But if you choose not to be, I get to go find my next older person. And I, I, I was just amazed by it. Um, but at the same time, I felt really for the first time in my life that this was a real possibility that, that there might be a future husband, husband, that never even entered my mind prior to that point. I've always looked at dating. Um, people will often say like the dating world is so hard and it's so difficult to date. And none of us, uh, very few of us actually enjoyed uh, the dating prospect with the intention of getting married. Married. Some people date just to date. Some people date for companionship and for uh, just relationships and sometimes just hookups or uh just the the self-fulfilling nature of dating and, and other people date uh, for long-term compatibility for uh, f the forever aspect of that relationship. And I, I'm interested in understanding how you two dated for long-term compatibility. What things were evident in, re in the relationship to both of you that said um, to each other, you know, this could be, this could be a marriage. This could be a long-term thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, like, like how we met it, um, we didn't really have long-term at, at the very beginning, but as, as, as soon as we got to know each other, that's when we, f we feel like, um, there is a great possibility for a long-term relationship here. And, I think just being able to have that discussion with family and friends and have, and have their support, um, really helped me, um, see a better picture for our relationship. Um, cause family is very important to me. Like in the Filipino culture, um, you know, we like, um, all your immediate family are together for celebrations. So, I want them to be able to um, be accepting of our relationship. And I think that's 
we did the work to introduce our family and our friends to each other and it's been great and maybe my approach was a little more pragmatic um josh says he graduated from the university of utah which by the way since i went to byu and he went to utah we always it's part of the fun of our relationship is we always like to tease each other about each other's schools uh we're both very big in sports which is not the common thing for gay men um we have been to each other's sporting events and things like that but Josh is not just a graduate of the U. He actually holds a master's degree in accounting. He likes to say he's a staff accountant. He's actually the senior accountant for his company. Um, he's very, um, uh, he's a humble person. That's, he said that earlier and that's the reality of who he is. And honestly, when I thought about compatibility, um, in so many ways, Josh grounds me because he doesn't put like, I would be the first person to tout a, you know, a higher level degree or things like that, where that's not what he does. He just likes to talk about himself as a common person. And maybe it's his upbringing, um, from much more humble means. Uh, but ultimately, um, there was so much in him uh, from a mature standpoint and from a, you know, this idea of, could I spend the rest of my life with him that, uh, every day just grew stronger and stronger. But of course we, we had to look at the realities, um, because I'm always going to be older and I'm always going to be different. Um, but I, th I think one of the ways we've made it work is we're very communicative with each other. In other words, we talk about all this sort of stuff. And I think that's what it made it easier for us to talk about those things with our families as well. Um, the other thing that I think we've done well is we do like to travel. Sometimes it's for business purposes, sometimes for pleasure, but in those travels, we probably learn more about each other than we do when we're just sitting around at the house. And, uh, yeah, uh, they've been different things that have led me to believe that it could be a lifelong relationship. Yeah. And, um, another thing that we did, um, early on in our relationship is, um, we kind of discussed or made a list of things that we are concerned about in our relationship. Like for me, I'm concerned that um, I'm still f finishing my master's um, at the U. I, I'm only working part-time at this company and I don't have um, a, a, a stable job when we met. Um, and the thing about me is I want to, I want to be able to be independent. You know, I don't want to, um, to rely on him. And I think we work through those um, concerns and issues and we talked about them. Um, and that's how we made it work. <laughs> One question that I'm often asked, uh, which it, not even a question that I ever really thought about until I also found myself in these situations is uh, during the, the progressive nature of a relationship in a typical uh, heterosexual relationship, there are cultural roles on who advances um, to a marriage proposal, who takes lead in um, the engagement process. So I'm curious how this unfolds in your relationship and how do gay couples uh, get engaged well, I would say um, one thing that we um, we made certain in our relationship is that no one takes control. Um, you know, I don't want it to be a situation where he's controlling me or I'm controlling him. I want us to be able to live our best lives and just be able to support each other. Um, but, you know, 
you know, I still have my feminine inside with me. So sometimes I, I feel like I'm, you know, like the woman of the, 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 the gay relationship. Um, I don't know what he's so saying. you so he, what he's saying is he did expect me to propose to him that was a definite i mean it was very understood by me if not in direct words that if there was ever going to be a proposal it needed to come from me but i also knew that josh needed it to be something more than me just getting down on my knee and asking him to marry me and so for months i had wanted to figure out how i could possibly do this in a way that would be um, one that would be acceptable to him, if that's all right to say that. Uh, at, but at the same time, maybe be available to our families. So um, I mentioned that I do community theater. So I actually was playing the Gene Kelly role in Xanadu on stage. And I had made the decision that I was going to invite my entire family, kids, brothers, sisters, my stepmom, and all of Josh's family to, quote, come watch me in Xanadu. But what none of them were aware of is that um, I had actually gone out and worked with a jeweler, designed a ring. And um, if you don't know, his fingers are tiny. And so I had to um, have a ring specially made. Um, and then um, on that night, I had told my cast members, which I had not said anything to prior, don't leave the stage after final bows because I had an announcement. Anyway, so... If you've never seen the show, at the end of the show, I was actually wearing like gold um, <laughs> tight pants with leg warmers um, that were rainbow color. It was it was a ridiculous looking uh, costume for the end of the show. But, um, you know, the the show Xanadu is all about dreams. And I talked about those dreams. And then what I did was ask my boyfriend to come down to the stage and so in front of the entire audience and more importantly our families um i did get down on my knees and i proposed to joshua i said yes <laughs> what was going through your mind not only uh, did you just get proposed to you got proposed to in one of the most public ways possible um i've always kind of teased him that I kind of wanted to do a public proposal. Like I've, I would send him videos of um, people doing flash mobs. Um, and I think he kind of took inspiration into that. So he, he put that in his show. And um, I think what's important for me is our love is, you know, is unique and different. Um, but I want to be able to show that. And I think that's important. It's not just for me to make a public um, grand proposal, but I want to be able to share it to people who may have not um, seen this kind of relationship and that it can work. I'm, um, I'm curious how now as this relationship is, is uh, forming, uh, I mean, we've, you've dated, you're to the point where you are engaged. Um, I want to talk about now the beginning of the marriage, the melding of two lives, because really a lot of what we've discussed in uh, this, this episode, both your individual episodes and this one, is this, um, this, this, this combination of, of multiple, uh, what society may often say uh, are competing experiences. Um, we have a generational experience, an intergenerational experience, um, just the age gap, as we've, we've discussed between the two of you. We have a cultural and racial uh, difference between uh, societies that each of you have been raised and grown up in. Uh, Richard, you are at the sunset of your professional career. Josh, you're at the sunrise of your professional career. How do you begin uh, combining um, those competing interests and competing experiences into a symbiotic relationship? 
Well, first of all, I, I will tell you, I am his biggest cheerleader as it comes to his career. And although I um, have zero say in his career and his work, um, I'm always there to support him. And why wouldn't I? He's got to take care of me in my golden years. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I think that we don't worry too much about money. Um, part of that comes from the fact that uh, no matter what happens to me career wise, I am a retired army officer. And so I get to benefit from a paycheck for the rest of my life. So we don't really think too much about, um, you know, how it all works that way. Um, we kind of tease each other about, uh, physically what that might look like down the road and such. Um, but Honestly, if two people didn't truly love each other, this would never work. I mean, anybody, if you were a scientist, if you were a psychologist and you were looking out in, you would say this is just not sustainable because we are, we're different races, we're different ages, we're different um, uh, in so many ways. But um, you you cannot discount or subtract the love factor from all of the decision making that we make. Um, Josh said earlier, and I, I kind of wish he would have phrased it a little bit differently. Like he's like, well, I don't, I don't want to be the one to telling him what to do. And I don't want him to tell me what to do. Honestly, if there was ever an example of a 50, 50 relationship, it's, it's us. Um, we don't have to argue about, um, a lot of things. Uh, I think our biggest arguments are, hey, can we just go out to eat tonight? Sure. Where do you want to eat? Well, you decide. No, you tell me. No, you decide. No. That's the extent of our you know, disagreements is just tell me where you want to eat. Um, hey, 100% uh, relatable. We have the same problem, <laughs> Jay and I. <laughs> But it's it, it's fun. Um, I have been introduced to so many things as a result of this relationship. Um, I went to really my first ever concert um, uh, with Josh up in Denver, and it was Taylor Swift. And I don't think that I could have sung a Taylor Swift song prior, um, but it was a fantastic experience. I'm a huge Pink fan, which people may laugh at. And I took Josh to a pink concert. And really, by luck, we ended up near the front row. Josh actually got to high five pink as she was exiting the uh, the audience. And it wasn't even him that um, initiated it. It was her initiating it to him. But the point is, we get to share things with each other that may not be the norm. Um, we're never going to be the grandma and grandpa that grow old together and, um, uh, you know, sit and knit or crochet or watch TV. Um, we're always going to be different. And travel has been a big part of that in the sense that it um, it affords us a lot of really cool experiences with each other. And most of them first times for both of us. Yeah, I think for for me, um, it's really a, a a lot about embracing our differences. We're very unique in our own special ways, but we try to um, try to introduce our likes and act, our interests um, to each other, and that's um, kind of how we evolved. Um, and also, what really helped us is very early on in our relationship we moved in together like three and a half months together and that was um you know i don't think that happens a lot but we did and we were able to see each other's um ways of life um you know just like how you know, like all your different routines. Um, so we were able to just learn more from each other from that experience. Did you find uh, throughout that dating experience, the, again, as we kind of opened up this segment about the, 
the blending of different cultures. Did you find limitations or uh, mountains or molehills in uh, two different cultural experiences? I think what's great for him is he went to Thailand to serve his mission. So he was able to see a little bit of the Asian culture um, and he's able to appreciate, um, you know, just kind of where I come from. Um, and he has, you know, he has knowledge of what, what that is. Um, yeah, because I think that's important to bring up not only just the way certain people live and the lifestyle, but we're also talking about um, traditions, religious rites, food, um, mm -hmm. just all aspects of culture that we don't often think about until you're kind of immersed in it. Yeah, and um, Richard has been very much open to the Filipino culture, um, the foods. Um, I enjoy cooking for him. Um, he's been trying my food and, and he's always, you know, very respectful. Like he would always ask, how do I eat this? Um, and you know, it's just a little bit, it just shows a little respect. Um, just trying to get to know more about what my, our, our Filipino foods are. Um, yeah. I, I definitely think that my my own Asian experience was vastly um, helpful. And I think it's not only just appreciated by you, but I think even your mom and your sisters have an appreciation for um, just an openness to the culture and everything. And I mean, that expands even beyond your immediate family, your aunts, uncles, who I have also grown to know and um, love and appreciate. And yeah. And, you know, like um, he's also learned to kind of um, deal with some of our traditions. Like for Christmas, we would put a Christmas gift on our Christmas tree, but we don't open gifts until New Year's Eve in the Philippines because it's just a bigger celebration and that's just like a family thing. And he, he welcomed that. And, um, what else? I was trying to think if there were anything the other way, but I would just say it's mostly just you willing to try different things on the American side or even the British side that, mm -hmm. Typically, you know, he wouldn't have been exposed to, but. Well, like clearly, uh, how many times did you have fry sauce in the Philippines? No, never. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was, it was a great, it was, yeah. We never had that in the Philippines. So it was <laughs> awesome. And I just realized like, uh, well, culturally, there's a lot of our listeners that aren't in Utah that are probably saying fry sauce. Yeah. Like, what on earth are you talking about? Uh, which is uh, definitely a Utah culture thing, but fry sauce is simply um, mayo, ketchup uh, mixed together. And if you're actually looking for the true uh, fry sauce recipe, you have to add some pickle juice to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we actually, since our move down here, it's been kind of like the miss. You never get that when you get your fries. But yeah, no, there's... There's no question that we have all these odd differences between us. Even the fact that, you know, you talked about skin color and things like that. Like, I love the fact that he is golden. And I wish I could be because if I go out and spend any amount of time in the sun, I'm going to be beat red. But um, to me, it's just, uh, it's been super fun getting to do a lot of different things and see a lot of things, eat a lot of different things. Our, we went to New York City for several days, and um, every time we travel, he will look for a Filipino restaurant, and we get to try it out, and it's been fun. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's been a very big sport. <laughs> even, like, even after... Um... Um, like, uh, in the Philippines, it's very famous. We have a famous ch Filipino food chain called Jollibee and it's a fried chicken and they serve very sweet spaghetti and, and he eats them and he actually enjoys them. So I, yeah, I'm very appreciative. <laughs> 
I want to move the discussion into the wedding um, because this is always like the sappy fun part. So these discussions and opportunities kind of peer into your world. <laughs> Uh, how do you prepare for a wedding and what does, uh, what does that preparation look like? And let's talk about the actual marriage. Our wedding was, um, very different because we, we got engaged when COVID started, hap um, started, um, actually the, the show that I proposed that was on a Saturday night, Sunday morning, I got a call from the theater saying because of COVID, the show had been canceled. So I was very grateful that we had had that last opportunity, but yeah, it and became planning this during COVID. Yeah. And so we got engaged in April and we wanted to get married in, in October, which is the month that we met each other. Um, just so that we have, you know, the same anniversary, um, date. Um, but, uh, we did all of the planning ourselves, finding, um, photographers, venues, food, catering. And we've also had, um, great support from my, um, our families too. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a struggle during doing it in the pandemic because you're not sure what's going to happen if people are able to come, um, especially, you know, it's ramping up. So, um, it's hard to plan. One of the things that we had decided to do early on was to, um, as tradition have the dance between in our case, husband and husband. And because we didn't have any real dance training for this type of dance, we had decided that we would take private lessons, um, and learn to dance together. So we would go once or twice a week and it turned out to be the, you know, the night that I would just long for, look forward to, because we would have this one hour um, class where we were taught to dance with each other. And our dance instructor was so good with us. Um, she knew what the purpose of our training was for. And um, I can recall towards the end of our training when we had kind of learned most of the, the steps that we would need to put our um, wedding dance together that we were in the middle of the dance and all of a sudden she left and we went ahead and finished our dance. And I knew what was going on when she left, but I couldn't understand why she left. What had happened was as we were in the process of this dance, I looked at my husband to be, and I was just amazed at this man that was in my arms across from me and every amount of love that a person can feel at one time was what I felt. And not only that, but I, as I'm looking at my husband to be, I knew that he felt what I felt and it was so strong. Well, when we finished the dance, our instructor came back and she said, I had to step away because I could see that you guys were having this moment that I did not want to destroy by being, you know, next to you, giving you instruction. It was just such a beautiful moment in our wedding preparation. Um, now the flip side of that is all of our, um, preparation for the actual dance happened on our living room floor. We had a, uh, we we had kind of a, a modern apartment that had a cement, like shiny cement floor. So we would move all the furniture out of the way and we would go through this um, choreographing our own dance. Now, if you want to talk about arguments, there were probably more arguments because Josh is like, you're not doing it right or you're doing this wrong or you got to do this or that. And but I will tell you, I would not trade one second of that time because it was just 
if you want to if you want to think about how a couple actually comes together and solidifies a relationship um i would say preparing for our wedding was not just a struggle but it was um it, it's what really built our relationship to where it is today yeah and another thing i'd like to add to the wedding planning is um being able uh, able to invite our family and friends um some of them may have not have not ever seen us together or they've just seen us online um and um like personally for me i was a little scared um when i sent my invitation to my aunt who introduced me to the lds church because i i was scared that she would be disappointed and that she wouldn't come but um she was actually very accepting and she was very loving of me and Richard. And it's just nice to, you know, as we're sending out this invitation and seeing all the RSVPs come in that, you know, we have all this family who stand next to us. The vast majority of the, of the people, whether it's friends or family that came to our wedding, it was their first ever gay wedding. And so yeah, it was important to us that it that it was something memorable for everybody. It was memorable for me. <laughs> Cuz I was there. Yes. You were there. So and look, we will ever be grateful for that because you helped make it a, a memorable event for us. It was beautiful. What happened was I was just like somebody's got to marry us and I knew I didn't want to like find just some some random person right so i'm like well i am part of this father's group maybe somebody knows somebody who can marry us and i thought i'll just post in there and and see what happens and when you responded i was like how in the world did we warrant getting you know the not just any old joe but like the top person that could possibly marry us and we were so excited and uh Super appreciative for sure. Oh, that warms my little heart again. <laughs> um, I I love I love those opportunities and and a lot of people don't know that I do. Um, uh, I am an ordained minister, so I, I do perform marriages. I often just I I joke because I say if, if you're gay, you don't pay. Um, <laughs> my idea is really just to give an opportunity um, in this space because what you're talking about is real for a lot of families. They want, um, often, uh, these are the very first, uh, same sex, uh, marriages that they've attended for the first time. So there's a delicate balance there. And the, the balance is difficult because not only are these, uh, marriages, the first ones that they attend, but it's often the first non Mormon, um, or non chapel version uh, of marriages that they'll attend as well. So I, as this minister in this ministerial uh, position, want to create an atmosphere that allows people to feel comfortable, but also to feel the spirit, uh, however they define that. Um, and, and more importantly, to feel the beauty and experience that moment um, with the couple. And so it is a del it's often like a trapeze artist. Um, it's a craft to be able to bring all of those sometimes uh, competing uh, interests all together under one tent. But I, I think um, your, your wedding was just beautiful. And not only did I think we nailed that, but the people who were there contributed to that spirit of oneness and, and the ability to, to blend all the things that we've talked about in this interview in, under one roof. Uh, in one event. And to me, it was, it was as meaningful uh, to me as I understand it was for you. And, and it is important because we had members of the church that were active. We had inactive members. We had non-members. But the reality is, I, I loved your speech in the beginning. Maybe speech is not the right term um, to use, but I, I loved it. N number one, it just sort of leveled the playing field for a wedding and it brought people regardless of what their background was 
into our space and allowed us to have this beautiful event. Um, anyway, I was going to say we've had um, members of the church who did attend who have told us how thankful they are that we invited them and how grateful they were to be a part of that. Um, so it, 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 to me, it was it, it built things beyond just creating a legal and lawful marriage. Um, it, it did so much more. Josh mentioned his aunt from San Diego that he worried about. And I, I, I love her and I have a relationship with her. And when we go to San Diego, it's exciting to be able to talk to her and she will reach out to me on Facebook or in messenger just at different times. And so, um, it, 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 it was, it was great. And, and it, there's, there's any number of things that help set things up for success, but I think the wedding in the midst of COVID, because in October COVID was still a real thing, we were able to pull that off and, um, really just present a beautiful experience. I, uh, I'd love for you to speak directly to those out there who uh, listen to your episode, who also are long-term compatibility minded, who are looking for long-term relationships and finding their person. Um, often, as we talked about earlier in this episode, when people date, um, that can be a frustrating process. It can be a process that they um, sometimes just uh, err on the side of giving up, that it's not worth it, um, that it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. How do you, how do you answer um, or speak to people who, uh, who do see an opportunity for long-term uh, marriage and uh, monogamous relationships becoming successful and, and them becoming fruitful in their, their uh, seeking after that type of relationship? Um, I think uh, maybe understanding that sometimes taking a risk is worth taking. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that background of dating and breaking up and dating and breaking up. Um, but I have many, many friends that have been through that and are in that. And it is frustrating and it is, um, maybe it feels hopeless at times. Um, I guess I, do you think that a relationship is worth having? Mm -hmm. And if, if you do, then is it worth taking that risk? And sometimes the risk doesn't pay off, but sometimes the risk in our case has been um, very fruitful. So I, I would just say, don't ever give up. And um, I all, I'm all, uh, sorry. I'm also a very big fan of the belief that there is somebody for everybody. And so sometimes we don't understand. I know people look at us and they don't get it. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, and sometimes we might look at a relationship and not get it. But the reality is, um, I, I love that we are open to love and want so much for others to be able to be loved. I really like that. I really love that. I, uh, I'm curious, um, now that you are married, uh, the, the blessings of marriage have, have unified this couple into one. Um, and as we kind of wrap the podcast episode and this three-part series, I want to kind of tongue-in-cheek ask a question. Um, what does now the gay agenda look like for this married couple? What does life look like on this side of the aisle? Uh, for us, it's a lot of traveling, a lot of exploring. Um, I know that travel is very big for Richard. And, um, you know, I want to be able to do a lot with him. And so in, I think every opportunity that we get, like recently, we just went to Hawaii. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, we, I love experiencing new things with him. Um, 
I know what he's saying. Well, and I, I don't know what the gay agenda is per se. Um, Josh cares more about what other people think than I do. And I think that that has come from much more years of experience of just feeling deep about what people say and think and choosing now not to let that be uh, an aspect of my life. So have we ever been given funny looks when we've been out together? Um, yeah, I can even think on Temple Square when we went on a date and got a lot of kind of crazy looks. Um like I said earlier, all we want is to be able to live our life uh, in the way that we know best. And um, and we'd, we'd love it for other people to have that same thing. We are very big on sharing uh, experiences with others. And um, but, yeah, I. I, I hope that here's. In our travels, one of the things that is very common is Josh is a very, he's a shutter bug. I don't even know that he knows what that term means, but pictures are everything. He has to take hundreds of pictures and a lot of it are at arm's length, right? You got to stick your arm out with your, with your phone. We are overwhelmed with the amount of people who say, please, would you let me take the photo? They don't care that we're gay. They don't care that we're from different generations. They don't care that we're from different um, ethnic backgrounds. What they see is one thing. Two people who love each other so much and that they're willing to stop and be part of that by just simply wanting to take the picture for us. Um, I, I have hope for the world. I have hope for the church. I have hope for the fact that one day two men walking you know, down the street side by side will look no different than a man and a woman or two women. Um, but I feel very blessed that I have this particular man and uh, I do have hope for, for everybody else. I, I think also maybe the next agenda for us is try to explore fatherhood for me because, you know, um, you know, Richard has had experience raising kids, but I would also like to have that experience. And um, I mean, I, I, I want to be a father. I, um, I've always, you know, I, I'm very caring and I will be able to provide that love to a child. And um, I know that that can be difficult for us to navigate because of our age differences sometimes. Um, so, you know, we just have a lot of lots of discussion about what that could look like for us, whether it's um, adopting somebody from the Philippines or... Um, having a surrogate or something, but I think that's what our, what our future is going to be. I love that because it's, uh, that's just raw and candid and uh, very vulnerable and open. Um, and I think like kind of the beauty of that is also how commu uh, like there's how much communication and uh, discussion there is on goals and opportunities and ways that you as a couple can work together. That's healthy. Um, <laughs> We don't see that in a lot of heterosexual relationships. <laughs> this gay agenda, it's really going to change the world. <laughs> you too, thank you. Um, we've, we've now completed three episodes uh, with the audience to be able to really take a um, deep dive into uh, each of your individual stories and your stories as a couple. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you were able to be uh, open and willing to share these intimate difficult, vulnerable, kind, emotional, spiritual parts of your journey uh, with the Latter-day Stories audience. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just, uh, I think I'm different and I'm a better person um, as I've been able to get to know both of you. And just personally, I want to say thank you. Thank you. For those of you um, who are interested in uh, maybe asking uh, this uh, Richard and Josh, this family, this couple, additional questions. Um, 
in the previous episodes, they both uh, mentioned that they are on social media. So they uh, have opened that door as well. And if you are commenting uh, or sharing on our uh, YouTube or Facebook page, it's a great way to also interact because I know that they are social media savvy. <laughs> um, and with their permission, we'll continue to invite the Latter-day Stories audience to reach out that way. Yep. Thank you to uh, you, the audience member, for those who are watching on a video episode or listening on an audio episode for participating uh, in this, our final part of our three uh, episode series. We invite you, if you haven't already, to listen to Josh and Richard's individual stories uh, posted previous to this one and give you an opportunity to really uh, listen to uh, the experiences that got them to where they're at today and know that those experiences are available to you as well. Um, the, we each have an opportunity uh, to love and be loved, and we each have the opportunity to live the fullest measure of our creation. Uh, if anything, it's podcast episodes like this that help us to know that we're not alone, that we can find commonality in these experiences, that we're not broken. There's nothing about us that needs to be fixed or repaired, that both church or political or governmental or societal influences uh, aren't there to change who we are, uh, but they should be there to support and lift and allow us an opportunity for individual autonomy and growth. And uh, that dovetailing in all of those is that your best days are ahead, that you have an opportunity to be happy, you have an opportunity to have spiritual experiences, you have an opportunity to see growth and companionship and love uh, living these honest truths. And those are invitations that I offer to you, uh, the listener. And, uh, and you may not be queer. You may not have uh, an, uh, an intersection at this spectrum or at, in this LGBTQ space, but someone that you know does. And the things that you can do today and tomorrow will benefit their ability to be happy the next day and the next day and the next day after that. So thank you. Thank you for being able to be a bridge builder and a bridge supporter. For the Latter-day Stories audience, I'm uh, super thankful for you participating and, and for experiencing this episode and others. We invite you to share this episode. We invite you to invite others who may not have uh, participated or enjoyed this to find and, and uh, experience what you have as well. And we are always uh, grateful for those people who do share content and episodes like this. It's stories like yours. It's stories like Richard's and Josh's and mine that help us each continue writing our own latter-day story. <laughs>